a large number of people today, and I would say we're almost up to the level of yesterday. So please welcome Brad Eppler. Thank you, Liz. I'll continue my humor career here. Uh, the, uh, and thanks, Carrie, for the uh, sponsoring this nice event. I've had a very pleasant couple of days. So, let's see here. Is, am I uh, audible in the back? So um, the classical theory of statistics uh, we inherited from uh, Pearson and Fisher and Neyman and Hotelling, et cetera, uh, was aimed at small data, uh, the kind of data sets an individual scientist might accrue in 1930 or 1950, and it was brilliantly effective uh, for, solving, for problems involving the estimation or testing of a single parameter of interest in a well-defined model. Um, uh, from by mathematical necessity, uh, this left uh, untouched uh, inference problems in uh, uh, messy big data situations uh, where database model selection plays a crucial role and where are perhaps hundreds or thousands of related parameters to consider. And today I wanted to talk about two methodologies aimed at large scale data analysis. And this will be all methodology, there's no philosophy today. Just, so I'm going to start out with a uh, method relating Bayesian and frequentist inference. So here's, uh, once again, a re reminder of Bayesian inference. Uh, parameter mu exists in omega. Observe data x, uh, prior g of mu, uh, probability distribution family f sub mu of x, uh, mu in omega. Uh, and uh, mu and x will be high dimensional, maybe infinite dimensional, but theta, the thing of interest, will have a speci specific parameter of interest, theta, that's one dimensional, theta equals t of mu. And we'll be particularly interested in the posterior expectation, e, I'll call it e of theta given x, the integral of t of mu, f sub mu of x, g of mu d mu, divided by the integral of f sub mu of x, g of mu d mu, Bayes rule. Uh, so a ratio of two, uh, two integrals. And um, as I said yesterday, when I was editor of the Annals of Applied Statistics, uh, perhaps 25% of the submissions used Bayes' theorem, but almost none of these started with what I would call genuine prior information. Uh, uh, rather, instead they followed in the tradition of uh, Laplace and Jeffries uh, using uninformative priors. Uh, intended to have neutral effects on final inferences. And in particular, uh, I'll follow through Jeffrey's suggestion here, which has been very influential. Uh, uh, if we don't know prior G, Jeffrey suggested using G of mu, the determinant of the Fisher information matrix to the one half power, where I of mu, let's see if this, uh, where I of mu is the covariance of the score function, that is the gradient of uh, log f of mu with respect to mu. And, uh, uh, and as Jeffrey said, this enabled you to be a Bayesian even if you didn't start with uh, known prior. Uh, and so we can still use Bayes' theorem and there's a, uh, a lot of good reasons to use Bayes' theorem, uh, but how accurate are these estimates then? And, and uh, the talk today, the first half, uh, the first of the two methodologies has to do with the uh, uh, accurate, the frequentest accuracy of a Bayes estimate. So, uh, so this is the every slide, every talk has either one or no important slides, and this is the one important one. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, it says general accuracy formula, and the general refers to the fact it doesn't have anything to do with uninformative priors. It's a general uh, Bayesian rule. Uh, so I'm going to take mu and x to be in p-dimensional space. Uh, that doesn't mean anything. p could be anything. v of mu is the covariance under mu 
of x, which I'll assume to be easy to find. It usually is. Uh, the um, uh, alpha x of mu is something important to us. It's the gradient with respect to x of log f of mu of x, uh, sort of the anti-score function. And then uh, uh, the lemma, uh, which only takes one line to state there, uh, e, the expected value of t of mu given x, uh, that's the thing we're interested in, has gradient, that is the rate of change of e with respect to x, of the posterior covariance between t of mu and alpha x of mu given x. And so that's a nice simple formula. And as soon as you have, um, as soon as you have, uh, that tells you how, how e is changing with respect to the data, and then uh, v of mu tells you how uh, x is changing, and so you put that together and you get the usual delta method estimate of standard deviation. Uh, uh, SDE is that covariance transpose, that posterior covariance times V of X times the covariance again to the one half power. So uh, roughly speaking, SDE is how much the Bayes estimate E might vary on a new data set X. And of course this is, uh, if you truly believe the prior, this is uh, irrelevant. Uh, it doesn't have any relevance. But if, if the prior is somehow chosen for convenience, in some sense, mathematical convenience perhaps, or to make up for the fact that you don't know the prior, then I, uh, uh, I believe that uh, the frequentist standard deviation of the, uh, has some relevance and is of interest. Um, and the implementation is um, uh, easy here, uh, uh, at least in the current uh, uh, wonderful co uh, computer world we live in where we can do things like this. Uh, so we, suppose we have a posterior sample of these mu's from x, mu1 through mu b. b is going to be a big number like 10,000 or something. After burn-in, uh, maybe we've used mcmc. And each, each mu i uh, gives ti, uh, the original st uh, parameter of interest evaluated at mu i, and also alpha i that alpha, uh, that alpha function and um, uh, evaluated for mu i. And, uh, and now um, the uh, third line there, the third bullet point, says that e hat is summation t i over b. Well, that's just the usual uh, EMC MC estimate, right? Uh, that's, how, that's why you do MCMC. You want to get a posterior expectation. You just do it by uh, simulation. Uh, you can also get that covariance that I wanted, that posterior covariance, by taking the empirical covariance between the alphas and the t's. And, uh, uh, and then uh, the standard deviation formula is just what I said before. Now I've written it in more compact form. Uh, and you'll notice that no additional MCMC sampling is required. Uh, that is, the same sampling that gave you E hat also gives you its frequentist standard deviation. So here's a data set we'll try it out on, uh, the diabetes data. Um, the uh, uh, second, first thing. Yeah. So uh, here's the diabetes data. Uh, N equals uh, 400. This is from a paper in, 19, in uh, 2044. And I've managed to uh, erase the names of my uh, co-authors, which was uh, uh, Hasty Tipsharani and Johnstone. Uh, so there's 442 subjects, uh, 10 predictors, age, sex, body mass index, seven other serum measurements for each of the subjects. And the response was the disease progression at the end of one year. And the model, after some scaling, is that boldface Y, all 442, uh, uh, 442 uh, uh, Y values, uh, is X uh, beta plus E. Uh, we can take the E to be normal noise with identity covariance matrix. Beta is what I called mu before. It's the 10 by 1. Uh, vector of unknown uh, coefficients, regression coefficients. X is the n by p matrix 442 by 10, 
which is the matrix whose i throw is the ten uh, uh, the ten uh, covariates for subject i. And um, uh, Park and Casella uh, uh, used in a nice paper in two thousand and eight. Uh, uh, suggested uh, using the uh, uh, Bayesian lasso on this very data set with this model, y normal x beta i. Uh, they took as their prior uh, uh, a sort of multidimensional Laplace prior, uh, g of beta e to the minus gamma L1 of beta. I forgot to write on the board there that L1 is the uh, uh, L1 norm, the sum of the absolute values of the beta j's. And if you do that, uh, uh, e to the minus gamma that, then the posterior mode is at the same place as the lasso estimate with that gamma as the regularization parameter. And they took, after looking at the data, they took gamma to be 0.37, so this is sort of an empirical base, but we'll just assume it's a real base prior. And I wanted to have, beta is 10 dimensional, and for the uh, illustration, I wanted to have a one dimensional thing to look at. So I rather randomly chose subject 125, and then theta 125 is x125, that subject's 10 uh, covariates uh, times beta. So we'd like, we're going to use uh, Bayes' rule to estimate. Uh, get a posterior distribution for theta 125, and then we're going to accurate, we're wondering how accurate are Bayes' posterior inferences for theta 125. So um, uh, Park and Casella uh, have a, a clever MCMC algorithm, and we got uh, 10,000 betas from it, uh, beta i equals one for 10,000. And each of the, um, each of the uh, 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 beta, hat, beta i's, uh, the MCMC's, give a theta 125 by dotting in x 125. So I had 10,000 of those. And if I could show you that, I should have, should have done a slide showing you that posterior distribution. It's almost a perfect normal curve, centered at 0.248 with uh, standard deviation 0.072. So 0.248 is the usual uh, MCMC estimate of, uh, uh, of the expected value for theta 125, given the Park and Casella prior, and given the uh, normal model, and given the data, of course. Uh, and 0.072 is the usual uh, standard deviation. Uh, and so, but uh, the usual Bayesian standard deviation, posterior standard deviation. The general accuracy formula, uh, much to my disappointment, uh, gave 0.071. Uh, I was, guess I was hoping for something much different. Uh, that is, the frequentist standard deviation would be much different. Uh, it isn't. Now, asymptotically, things are supposed to work out this way. Uh, uh, that is, maximum likelihood estimates, you're supposed to get the answer, same answer both ways. But we're not in asymptotic land, and the prior isn't uninformative. And uh, uh, I then looked, and I found that I'd chosen my subject 125 rather poorly. And if I'd chosen other subjects, the answer came out different. And as a matter of fact, the frequentist answer could come out as small as half as big as the Bayesian answer in this case. Um, anyway, uh, the two numbers, uh, though the same, mean different things. This is the Bayes posterior distribution, taking the Park Casella prior as gospel, and this is the frequent of Stanford deviation. Um, here, here's a perhaps more exciting example uh, from the same, uh, the posterior CDF for subject 125. Uh, it says uh, CDF at C, the probability that theta 125 is less than C given the data, uh, Y is standing for all the data. Uh, and all we have to do is change uh, the, the parameter of interest from Ti to Si, Si being one or zero as Ti is less than C or greater than C. And then the uh, MCMC estimate for the CDF is just the, the average of the Si's. And for uh, C equals 0.3, uh, 
I just chose 0.3, that number came out to be 0.762. So there was more than three quarters chance posterior of, uh, of subject 125 being less than 0.762. Uh, now, now there is no natural Bayesian uh, estimate for how accurate that 762 is unless I go and add another hierarchy to the Bayes rule, uh, to the Bayes prior. But I can do my frequent of standard deviation and it's 0 0.304, which is rather large. Um, so uh, the black curve here is the whole CDF, not just at 0 0.3. And uh, uh, if I just give you that curve, uh, it looks pretty impressive and accurate, right? It's a CDF. This is the posterior CDF based on those 10,000 MCMCs, uh, given the Park and Casella prior. Um, but uh, what I've drawn, the, the red lines, plus or minus red lines, are plus or minus one frequent of standard deviation. And what you can see is that from a frequentist point of view, we don't know, uh, we don't know that curve very well. Uh, it's, it's not hopeless, we just don't know it very well. The, um, this point here is 0 0.342, that's the upper 95% point for the black curve. The 95% uh, 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 upper credible limit. And if, if you take the Park and Casella prior seriously, that's the number. 95% of the time, theta 125 is going to be less than that number. Uh, uh, however, uh, the general accuracy for formula says that it's got a standard deviation. Standard deviation is about 0.069. So uh, this is about how, how well we know that number. It's not, that is, if we've got another uh, 442 subjects, we might, get, might have quite a different number. Um, uh, and now a, a critic might notice, and I bet many of you have, that these numbers go outside the range 0, 1, uh, uh, which we know it can't be, which is just to say that um, uh, sta uh, frequent of standard deviations aren't perfect. Uh, they're a rather crude uh, estimate of variability. And I'm, going to, I'm just going to say, without going into detail, I'm going to say you can do better if you're willing to go to the next level. Next level involves exponential families. Um, uh, and uh, I bring this up because the general formula is particularly easy to uh, implement in exponential families. So I've written the family as f sub alpha of beta hat, uh, where uh, alpha is the natural parameter, e the alpha transpose beta hat, and beta hat's the sufficient statistic with expectation parameter beta equals e sub alpha of beta hat. And I always remember this notation better if I think of the Poisson case where um, uh, uh, f sub mu of x, e to the minus mu, mu to the x over x factorial, x is beta hat, mu is beta, and alpha is log of mu. And what, what happens in exponential families is that thing I called alpha before, the reverse score function is alpha, or at least it can be taken to be alpha without any change. And so the formula uh, uh, for the frequentist co uh, variance, uh, frequentist standard deviation, is that now the, involves the posterior covariance between uh, the parameter of interest the natural parameter and uh, given the sufficient statistic beta hat. And this is generally easy to do. Um, and I'm not going to uh, dwell on this. So it's in your handout, but I'm, that's about as far as I'm going to go, uh, except to say that you can get a better theory that does second order uh, confidence, bootstrap confidence intervals uh, for so you're getting bootstrap confidence intervals uh, for, uh, which are frequent as confidence intervals for the Bayes posterior expectation. And it, again, it doesn't take any extra uh, MCMCing or something. And uh, um, here it is for the, uh, here it is for the uh, uh, 
CDF example, and now indeed the blue lines, these are 68% uh, uh, confidence in, uh, regions. Uh, they do indeed stay within the 0, 1 limit. And there, there's nothing very hard that I skipped. It's just it's more technical than I wanted to go into. So, that concludes, uh, remember I said I was going to do two, uh, I was going to do two uh, problems uh, in, uh, that are useful for uh, big data, uh, maybe stretching the uh, definition a bit. And the, uh, so this is, we're getting to the second one. Uh, and now we're going to switch gears from Bayes to uh, pure frequentist applications. Um, and this is my second example of things that Fisher, Neyman et al. didn't solve for us. They solved an amazing amount of stuff for us. Uh, and every time I go off the track, I'm sorry that they didn't solve more stuff, but I'm counting on people here uh, to come through in the years ahead. Uh, uh, so it says usually, uh, this is estimation after model selection, and usually applies to me. Uh, uh, this has been a, a way to say my bad habit uh, over the years, uh, besides getting kicked out of school. I had other bad habits, uh, uh, statistical ones. Uh, da new data would come in. Uh, usually I just look at the data and sort of informally choose a model. If the regression, I might choose linear, quadratic, or cubic depending on how it looked. Then I'd fit the estimates using the chosen model. And then I'd analyze the fit as if uh, it was pre-chosen. That is, I'd forget that I somehow did model selection. And so the, this final example today is to include model selection process in the analysis. What's the effect on standard errors and confidence intervals? So a second data set. Uh, this is really an old experiment. Late 1960s, 70s, cholestyramine was a, um, uh, a gritty powder that was uh, one of the earliest drugs that was uh, tried to reduce uh, blood cholesterol. It wasn't clear that you could reduce blood cholesterol. And this was a massive experiment of which I'm showing you just a small part. Uh, 164 men, this, and actually they were male doctors. It's the early 1970s, late 60s. Each took cholestyramine for some, some seven years, and two things measured for each man, a compliance measure ranging from zero to 100%, except I'm going to adjust that, make a transformation so it's about normal zero one, and why the response variable is the cholesterol decrease. So big decrease it was good, the drug was working. And uh, to, to fix our ideas, I'm going to say that we wish to estimate uh, the regression values, the expected value y given x equals xj. That is, mu j is the expected, uh, is the expected cholesterol decrease for a man who complies as much as Dr. J. Dr. J, I didn't think of that. <laughs> not, not the basketball player. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, boldface mu will be all 164 mu's. And so here's the nice data. Uh, it's always nice to see a scatter plot, right? Uh, a lot nicer than all that letters and numbers. Uh, so these are the 164 men. Uh, here's the compliance. Changed to a normal 0, 1 scale. At the far left, not, didn't take any. At the far right, took 100%. Uh, and the y's are uh, the circles. And you can see that, indeed, uh, taking more seemed to do good, seemed to, uh, seemed to increase your response. Uh, and we wish, uh, we, uh, we're, we're, we're on a wish. We wish to estimate all the mu's, and we can just read them off of the green curve here. The green curve is a cubic fit. 
to the uh, data, and the, and this time I was being careful in, to say how I how I did the cubic fit. It had to do with CP method, which I'll t I'll review in just a minute, and uh, uh, the. Um, um, so, uh, uh, quest so we get one estimate for each doctor, and the question is, how accurate are those, by just reading off the green curve, and the question is, is how accurate are those estimates taking into account both the CP selection and the ordinary least squares after we did CP? And I, uh, the five red points are five doctors I've chosen just so later I can have a table that doesn't spread out too much. And in particular, Dr. One here is the bad doctor. He's the doctor who didn't take any of his uh, cholestyramine, and he was punished. He didn't get much cholesterol decrease. Uh, and we'll follow Dr. One uh, just to have a single thing to look at. So here's a review of CP, which is, you, you might think of CP as an early uh, big data method because it, it has that aspect. So uh, this is Colin Mallow's idea. So we have uh, a linear model, a homoscedastic linear model, y, boldface y equals x beta plus e, uh, n by m structure matrix, m columns, and beta, an unknown m vector. And uh, the CP criterion in the box is uh, Ordinary least squares, y minus x beta hat squared, uh, plus a penalty for how many, co how many covariates we had, 2m sig sigma squared. Uh, uh, the, the thing in the box is an unbiased estimate of prediction error. Um, and uh, uh, so beta hat is the ordinary least squares, and m is the degrees of freedom. And so the idea uh, uh, from model selection is we have competing models, x1, x2, x3, maybe increasingly big, uh, choose the one minimizing CP, and then do ordinary least squares. So by putting in the penalty term, that means you don't necessarily choose the uh, biggest model. Otherwise, you just would choose the biggest model because that would reduce the sum of the squares the most. So our question is to assess the accuracy of the regression estimates taking account of the CP selection process. Here, here's, the, um, uh, here's the CP table uh, for the cholesterol data. Uh, I, I fit six increasing models, linear, quadratic, cubic, quartic, quintic, sextic, uh, degrees of freedom two through seven. CP, I've subtracted 80,000, so it's easier to look at the numbers. And you see that cubic is the smallest, is the winner. And uh, uh, that's why I chose cubic uh, in the picture. That's the cubic regression. And I chose cubic because of the CP. But you can see this is sort of a hard question from a traditional classic point of view because everything is so discontinuous in the way you choose go between models. The, um, Last column here is, is a bootstrap <laughs> replication of the whole thing. Uh, I did some non-parametric bootstraps, I'll tell you in a second, to see how s stable the cubic selection was. And in 34, there were actually 4,000 of them, and 34% of them chose cubic. That was more than any of the others, but it was still only one third of them. 19% uh, chose linear, 21% uh, chose quintic. So between those two, that's 40%. So cubic is, the, is modal, but it's not, uh, it didn't win the election. Uh, there, there's a lot of chance that things might have turned out different than cubic. That's what the story, that's what the bootstrap story says. So I did a non-parametric bootstrap analysis. Um, uh, and at this point, I, I have to say I was living in a fool's paradise, but you'll see what the, para uh, the fool's paradise is better than no paradise at all, but uh, uh, you'll see what I was being foolish about in a minute. Um, so I, I was just rolling along. Data, data XIYI pairs, 164 pairs. 
Uh, they gave the original estimate mu hat equals x3 beta hat 3. And I should have put a hat on the threes because the three was chosen from the data also, not just the beta hat. And so then a bootstrap data set, data star. I draw 164 pairs with replacement from the 164. And now I have a new data set, data star. And I can make another table like this one, but it won't be the same because the data is different. And now I can go through the whole rigmarole. I do the CP. I choose the best M uh, model, M star. And we know that 34% of the time that worked out to be cubic. But a lot of times it worked out to be something else. Then I choose do o OLS. I uh, get the best beta hat for that M star, and I get mu hat star, X M star, beta hat star, M star, and I did this all 4,000 times. And in our world of uh, plentiful computation, that only took a few seconds. Um, and here's, um, here was my first hint that things weren't going to go as nicely as I thought. Um, the, um, uh, this is the histogram of the 4,000 uh, estimates for bad doctor one. And um, uh, uh, 2.71 was his estimate. And of the 4,000 uh, bootstrap applications, the histogram looked ugly. It's sort of multimodal. And more to the point, 76% uh, of the numbers were less than the original number. And that, that's something that never had happened to me in my previous bootstrapping life. Usually, a number has come out between 40 and 60%, and the histogram looks pretty nice. And, and the trouble was that I, was, um, I was, had the wrong mental picture in mind. And um, uh, here's the wrong picture that I had in mind from uh, the previous bootstrap work. Um, uh, this is a schematic picture, of course. Uh, here, y represents all the data, the blue point, and the, uh, the uh, ellipsoids, the concentric ellipsoids, are uh, the bootstrap distribution spreading out uh, around y. And the red curves are uh, uh, isoplasts of equal estimation of t of y, t of y being Dr. One's estimation in this case. And, if, and this is the smooth estimation model. And if this holds uh, asymptotically, and you don't even have to be very asymptotic, you get really pretty good results from the bootstrap, usually. But um, uh, this picture doesn't hold in our case. Uh, here's the, uh, uh, your brain on model selection. Uh, the, uh, uh, in this case, the uh, wedges are supposed to represent different regions of the sample space where you get different, uh, where you get different uh, models selected. So the, this region might be the one where you choose cubic, quartic, quint, uh, quadratic, etc. And the uh, ellipsoids are still the same ellipsoids. And this is at least qualitatively right in that we know that we didn't stay always within the uh, original uh, region. We, 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 about two thirds of them were outside the original region, and what goes wrong is that the lines of equal uh, estimation are no longer smooth; they break at the uh, boundaries. And of course, the picture is greatly simplified because things are really high dimensional. But this gives you a pretty good idea of what what goes wrong. And so now I thought I better do something to make things better. Um, and of course, one thing to say is one of the reasons we don't have an effective theory uh, from uh, classic statistics for uh, model selection, estimation after model selection, is that this makes for very bad mathematics. Uh, it's ugly, right? It doesn't. However, given our tremendous advantage in um, uh, tremendous advantage in computation, uh, we we should be able to do something to uh, uh, salvage the situation. Uh, oh, this is what, this is an interesting graph too. Um, the uh, uh, here's the box plot of the four thousand uh, estimates for Doctor One, bad Doctor One, uh, separated by which model was selected. And you'll notice that when Model Three was selected, uh, you got a big value 
for doctor one, not for the other doctors necessarily. Whereas with model one or model five, you got smaller ones. And that's why we had that multimodal look. And that's why uh, uh, the actual, uh, the actual uh, choice was three, and that tended to give big numbers. And that's why uh, uh, the, do the doctor's estimate was bigger than most two three quarters of the other ones. So you got to do something about this if you want to get any idea of accuracy. Uh, so uh, the idea, which is a simple one, uh, uh, it's a good idea uh, to replace this original estimator. The trouble with model selection is the estimator starts getting jumpy. They jump around. Small changes in the data make big changes in the estimate. And that causes. Uh, a lot of bad behavior, and it makes for uh, poor inference. And so the idea here, which is an old idea, is to replace the original estimator, t of y, the unsmooth estimator, with the bootstrap average. s of y is the average of the 4,000 estimates for Dr. 1. Uh, in general, it would be for the four, whatever the original estimate was. So this is model averaging. Uh, it's the same as bagging uh, bootstrap aggregation, Leo Breiman's uh, nicely carried out idea for prediction. And Leo was mainly interested in reducing variance by smoothing. Uh, and I'm interested in reducing variance too, but I'm also interested in removing discontinuities. And the effect of smoothing is to change this picture into this picture because things no longer uh, move discon discontinuously as you cross the boundary. Now, it's not perfect, of course, but uh, the, the computer gives us lots of room for uh, uh, um, uh, repairing troubles. Uh, and now, uh, so finally, my idea is going to be, I'm going to get this smooth estimate, and I'm going to center a confidence, a rough confidence interval, say 95%, plus or minus 1.96 at the smooth estimate times the standard deviation estimate for the smooth estimate. Well, I'm in a little bit of trouble here now because uh, it took me 4,000 uh, original estimates to get one S. So if I'm going to bootstrap this to get SD tilde, am I going to do 4,000 times 4,000? No, I'm not going to. Uh, it turns out there's another theorem not so much different than the first theorem I gave you. Uh, this one I just call the accuracy theorem. I dropped general from there. Uh, so no, uh, just to simplify the notation, uh, S naught is the smooth estimate, the average. T i star is the ith bootstrap unsmooth estimate. And crucially, uh, y i j star is the number of times the jth data point appears in the ith bootstrap sample. So if j is 1, Dr. 1 might appear not, not at all once, twice, three times. That would probably be it uh, in, the, in a bootstrap sample i. And now, having done the bootstrapping, the original bootstrapping to get the t stars, uh, we can just uh, almost instantaneously uh, get these yij stars and take the bootstrap covariance between yij star and the ti stars. And so that takes all, all the time is usually in the, in the uh, resampling. Uh, and then the theorem is that the delta method standard deviation for S0, SD tilde, is the sum of squares of those covariances to the 1 half power. And there's a corollary. This number is always less than this number, and this number is the ordinary bootstrap estimate of standard deviation for the unsmooth estimate. So at least in terms of these two numbers, the smoothing is going to reduce variability. Um, uh, this whole thing is, is a projection kind of theorem. Um, the, um, uh, the amount of savings, uh, so this is a really schematic picture. Uh, T star is the vector of 4,000 uh, unsmoothed estimates. Uh, uh, it's in 4,000 space. L of Y star is the linear space spanned by those bootstrap counts, and it's 164 dimensional. And 
I've projected T star down into L of Y star, and the, uh, 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 the theorem is essentially that the, the uh, uh, ratio of variance, the smooth to unsmooth, is the cosine of the angle at the bottom of that triangle. And so if, uh, if the interpretation is that if, uh, if uh, the, the statistic is very nonlinear, you'll save more by smoothing because there'll be more to project down. And, and model selection estimates tend to be unsmooth. Uh, with that in mind, I was a little disappointed I didn't really save all that much. Uh, here's the, um, uh, the heavy curve here, the red curve, is the ratio of uh, the SD tilde to, S, to uh, the bootstrap estimate of the unsmooth estimate, the smooth standard deviation to the unsmooth. And for doctor one, the bad doctor, it's 68%, so you save quite a bit by smoothing. Uh, but for the average of all the doctors, it was 90%. So you save some by smoothing, but it wasn't as much as I would have thought. Um, uh, the little green line, I don't know if you can show it, see it there, is the ratio of the naive standard deviation to the smooth bootstrap standard deviation. Naive meaning ignoring model selection, doing what I said I was bad, usually was bad at doing. And for Dr. Four, for example, um, uh, the uh, uh, number is 48%. That is the... Uh, if you don't take model selection into account, you've uh, artificially reduced the standard deviation by a factor of two. So at least in this problem, it's quite important to take that into account. One more example of using this. Um, uh, model probably, uh, probability estimates. Um, you remember that 34% uh, of the 4,000 bootstrap replications chose the cubic model. Uh, this is sort of a poor man Bayes posterior probability for cubic, roughly, you might think. Uh, and you can do better, but we won't do it here. And so we can ask how accurate is that 34%? It's an average, too. And so we can apply the accuracy theorem to the indicator function for choosing cubic. And I did that, and I got another shock. This whole thing was sort of shocking to me. Uh, the 34% estimate was plus or minus 24%. 19% was plus or minus 24%. 21% was plus or minus 27%. That is, these numbers weren't accurate at all. If you ran another experiment, they might come out completely different and uh, differently. And the, um, uh, I, I Tried the same thing. I didn't do a lot of them, but I did a couple more also in the, using Bayesian model selection. And the, the fact is, I've learned that model selection is, is a lot less accurate than I would have thought to start with, at least in the examples I saw. Uh, that doesn't mean that model averaging is bad. It just means that you shouldn't count on the model that you, uh, these kinds of probabilities as being very accurate. So, uh, I used to say uh, that we had a million to one advantage over our classical predecessors in computational ability. And now I'll make that 100 million to one because things have gotten better uh, at a fast rate. And, and that gives us leverage on problems that used to be out of reach, like the two examples I just talked about. Um, and on the other hand, um, statisticians are now faced with enormously bigger, bigger data sets and huge tangled webs of interrelated questions involving estimation, testing, and prediction. Uh, I guess that's what people mean with big data. Um, and, and all of this has put um, uh, statistical application and theory uh, into a, a fevered state of rapid evolution and excitement. Uh, which is, is good. Uh, you want to be in a field like that. Uh, so let me paraphrase Wordsworth. Uh, these days it's bliss to be a statistician. To be a young statistician is heaven itself. So thank you.
Um, I, I'm not sure if you kind of were diplomatic there, but the first part of your talk where you computed the standard deviation. Say, say it again. When you computed the standard deviation for the Bayesian <coughs> estimate. For right, the frequency standard deviation for the Yes. Base. Have you compared it to the standard deviation for the frequency estimate for the parameters? Well, I, I, I didn't do the frequent assessment. It, it actually, it was about the same, I think, in that particular case. But I didn't have um, an obvious, uh, that is, I could have done, say, the, it was a lasso ex example. I could have done the, um, the bootstrap for the lasso using the, the second part of the talk to get an estimate of the smooth disk. I would have had to do some smoothing right. because of the model selection. But I'm wondering, in general terms, is there a kind of rough equivalence between choosing a non-parametric, uh, or sorry, a non-informative prior, and uh, getting an estimate from there, and doing a frequency estimate, and you know, would the standard deviations be roughly the same? Well, Always. The um, uh, I wasn't trying to make a philosophical point there. I was just trying to say that the idea was. Uh, uh, you have, for some reason or another, you've decided to do a, uh, a Bayes estimate of something of interest, and you've gotten a number, and how accurate is that number from a frequentist point of view? And that, that was all I was trying to say. So uh, there was no more, uh, uh, the delta method is just a standard method for getting a, 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 an, an estimate. It can be done either parametrically or not parametrically here I was doing parametric right and, and I have a second question just the second part of your talk and that is you know you've mentioned that these things kind of jump around when you choose these but there are alternatives like non-parametric smoothing like smoothing spline for instance yeah. where the degrees of freedom is kind of varies continuously so would that kind of give you a better kind of period estimate if you use ah, that? so that's a good point um, uh, the, the, uh, what I didn't say, uh, or wasn't thinking of perhaps, was maybe if you see too much jumping around, you ought to do, think of something else, right? Uh, so my, in my case, the something else was the smooth version, but you might have chosen a original statistic that was a good deal smoother uh, than the one that we had. Uh, yeah, that was good advice. Other questions? I'll ask, oh, go ahead. At the, when you show confidence intervals, you say, well, you show each of them is like 95 or something yeah. like that. You don't think that there's a whole need to see like a uh, simultaneous confidence interval for, for those all points together? Oh, no, those were one at a time. Those were one at a time confidence yeah. intervals. They weren't global. But I didn't tell you in that picture. Let me see if I can bring it back. This one was the picture that you had in mind. I had also the other picture, but yeah. Uh, so, uh, what I didn't tell you is that the uh, standard error, if you, if you look at this more closely, what happens in uh, frequentist repl replications of this is the whole curve moves either left or right quite a bit. That is, it isn't that it's bopping up and down independently at different points. What's the you can go further and say what the errors, what the errors are, uh, and that they're about this. It's about this much back and forth uh, between different frequentist realizations of that. That's the implication. <coughs> Other questions? Yeah, we have one uh, more. Uh, did you do model averaging for this one? Or is model averaging actually well, you know, improve the uh, accuracy at this point? In the model, when did I do model averaging? No, did you do that? Yeah. Did you try it? Well, the, the, what I call bootstrap smoothing is model averaging. That is model averaging. I was in this particular case. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, we don't. <clears throat>
Liz has given me the uh, honor today to present to Dr. Uh, Efron a, a, a plaque in appreciation for his uh, visit to Duke and for his presentation of this year's uh, distinguished lectures for the Department of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics. I'm sure that I speak uh, for all of you in uh, that uh, we truly have had uh, two what I consider to be very distinguished lectures and uh, it's, it's wonderful to have uh, such a pioneer in the field, uh, uh, someone who, whose work uh, we've admired and referred to for many years to come and, and visit uh, at Duke. This, uh, uh, I've, I've tried uh, without success to get, to dissuade Liz from attaching my name to this, uh, <laughs> to these lectures. Uh, this is not anything to do with Carrie Lee. This has to do with uh, biostatistics and statistics and bioinformatics. Uh, at Duke University. I remember, I, I was one of the very first faculty members uh, uh, that uh, was recruited to Duke, uh, Duke uh, School of Medicine, uh, as, uh, as a faculty member in biostatistics. When I look at this remarkable group of people that uh, we have assembled today and the growth of the Department of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics. Uh, back when I came, there was, uh, the, it, it was just a, a gleam in our eye that one day we would have a department like this. There was no Department of Statistical Sciences. Um, biostatistics was sort of a foreign, word, uh, language. There was just uh, relatively little activity. And, and so the progress and the growth and the development uh, and, and the important role that biostatistics and statistics is now playing uh, in all of this research activity, both within the medical school here as well as, as across the entire university is, is really, uh, I think, remarkable. And so I say, hooray for biostatistics. <laughs> hooray for statistics. Hooray for bioinformatics. We are in a great era of time, and to be a young statistician like so many of you who are here today at a time like this is, this is a golden era, but thankfully we have pioneers like uh, Brad Efron who paved the way and uh, uh, helped us to um, uh, gain insights and uh, understand the approaches to statistical issues that I think uh, will carry us forward for many generations. But I'm sure I speak for all of you in expressing appreciation uh, to you, Brad, for coming to Duke, for these wonderful lectures, uh, for all that you've contributed to the field of statistics. And so we're grateful to present uh, to you this plaque in appreciation for uh, being our distinguished lecturer. Thank you. And the pleasure's not over. Just remember, there's a reception upstairs in 7015 now. <laughs>